Hey guys and welcome back to Unicodeb. In this video I'm gonna show you how to import a Python model generated using TensorFlow into Unity. Now there is a standard way to do this which is using the ONNX format and then using Barracuda which is a Unity library to actually import the Python model into Unity. We are not gonna be doing that today. Today I'm gonna show you an alternative way I found to import the Python model. And you might say, Nico, why would we ever use this alternative way? Well, because I was doing some test projects in the past and I actually had some trouble converting TensorFlow models which were in different formats like H5 or just a TensorFlow saved project into Unity. Because in order to do that and in order to use Barracuda, I had to convert those models into ONNX, which is a different format. And sometimes, because of version mismatch or because of some optimizers, I actually couldn't import those models and I actually had some trouble. This new method that I found is actually much simpler and the only downside is that you have to run an actual Python server while your Unity app is running. The way that it works is basically that we have a Python server that has TensorFlow, which is basically running the model, and then we communicate through Unity via WebSocket to receive the inputs of our model and we calculate the outputs. In this way, we can execute the model, but we could also manipulate the code in order to train it as well. So right here, I have a model that is trained on the eMNIST dataset, which is basically like MNIST, but for letters. This means that I can draw a C and it's gonna predict correctly that this is a C. I can also, uh, I don't know, draw another letter and it's gonna predict it correctly. And I can go again and again. Well, it didn't work this time, but you get the gist of it. And now I'm gonna show you how this actually works. But before doing that, please leave a like and subscribe on the video so, I don't know, we can reach more people and, you know, more people can be helped by these tutorials. Or, I don't know, if you want to share this with your friends or other people that might be stuck and maybe are trying for some reason to import a Python neural network into Unity and they don't know how, let me know how you actually found this video and it would be really helpful to create more content as well. Also, if there is anything you want me to do a tutorial of, just leave it in the comments and then I'm gonna reply if I know how to do that tutorial. And if I don't know how to do it, I'm not gonna reply because, you know, I don't wanna seem like the guy that doesn't know anything, but uh, what are you talking about? Okay, but jokes aside, if you have any ideas for better tutorials, leave them in the comments, I'm gonna uh, take a look at all of them. Anyway, let's get started. First of all, I'm gonna show you just briefly how the UI works, but it's pretty self-explanatory. We have these two uh, sliders right here that basically control the radius of the input area and the strength. Another thing that we have is constant prediction, which basically will send our network, which is in the Python server, a prediction every time the table of pixel right here changes, which is really experimental because it can stress the WebSocket and sometimes it crashes, but it's actually pretty good to see. As you can see, it predicted it really quick. Okay, let's pretend this is a Q. I don't know, maybe the, it doesn't do the D. Okay, there, it did it. Uh, let's do, a, I don't know, a B, but let's actually drive it correctly this time. Okay, there you go. Okay, this is really amusing. But okay, let's see actually how this works in the code. We have four simple classes. I'm gonna go briefly through all of them. Naturally, the code is only in the description. The first two classes are only for the UI. So basically, this is a script that is on every single pixel. Uh, as you can see, we have the pixel prefab right here, which is just a pixel that can be black or white or any shade of gray. And so we have these functions to change the color and all of that stuff. I guess you don't care about this. Then we have our pixels handler that basically generates all of the pixels. In our case, the input is a 21 by 21 table. So we're gonna generate this number of pixels and we're gonna instantiate their prefabs. And this is the code that actually draws on the table, which is also really simple. It's basically doing a physics overlap circle all and modifying all of the pixels that are affected by the mouse simply uh, by the strength component, which is basically the slider I described before. And also the radius is given by the radius slider. Finally, if constant prediction is on, so that toggle that I showed before is on, then predict every time there is a change. We also have a reset button, which basically resets the entire table, and also the predict UI, which happens when you click the predict button. Okay, now that all of the UI is out of the way, we can actually go into the core of this, which is the Python server. So this function right here is actually the predict button, and every time I want to do a new prediction, I'm gonna first read the pixel from all of the inputs, which is basically done by getting all of the pixels that I have instantiated and getting their color. And this is basically the input, which is a 21 by 21 tensor. 
And then I pass this input into my client, which I'm gonna show in just a moment, and I receive an output, which is an array of float. Naturally, this is specified by the model that I have right here, the model.h5, which basically returns a float of 26 elements, which are the letters of the alphabet. And naturally, the element which are with an higher number means that it's the element the network is more accurate about, and which is the letter that the network has predicted. So I'm gonna get that one, and I'm gonna put it into a text. Funny story, you might actually say, Nico, why aren't you right here modifying the text from Unity? You're actually doing, why are you not doing prediction text dot text? Well, the reason I'm not doing this and modifying the text view from Unity is because this is not the main thread. This is a callback. So it's actually gonna give you an error if you do that. So this is why I'm storing it into a different variable. And then in the update function, I'm actually assigning the text to this temporary variable. This is just an heads up because I lost quite a lot of time just because of this stupid line of code. Also, we have an error handling function, which right now is empty because I'm a really good coder, but right here in theory, you could put some try catches to see if the socket is gone for some reason and you can open another one and all of that stuff. But yeah, we're gonna put a little to do here and just forget about it, you know, this can just stay this way. Okay, but jokes aside, let's actually see where we're generating this client. We're basically generating it right here. Oh, I'm actually getting it from Unity, from the inspector. But basically, this prediction client is this one. So in order to communicate from Unity to Python, I'm using an external library, which is going to be linked in the description. It's basically this one, and it's honestly really, really helpful. So go check that out and give it a star, maybe, uh, on uh, the Unity Hub. I think it's a, it's a heart, actually, it's not a star, but give it whatever means of likeness there is on the website. But anyway, using that library, I'm actually creating a new class, which is a runnable thread, which is a prediction requester. This class is going to have a request socket, which is our client, and then it's going to have two callbacks, which are the ones that are going to happen if the output is received correctly, so if we get an array of floats, or if there was an exception. Then we're going to run this thread, and this is basically the code that I got from the library that you can check out in the description, and all that it's doing is it's connecting to a local port, 555, by the way you can change this, of course, and then it's retrieving the bytes. Every time it receives some bytes, it's gonna copy these bytes and transform them into a float array, which is basically the output that they want, and then it's gonna invoke the callback function. The callback function is the one we defined earlier when we actually send the input, which is all the way right here. This one is the output function. The send input function instead is the one used to send the input to the server, and as you can see, we're doing the exact same thing, but backwards. We are taking the float array, transforming it into a byte buffer, and then sending it via client.sendFrame byte array. Naturally, all of this has to happen after we initialize our client, and we're actually initializing it right here. We do initialize server that creates a new instance of the prediction requester that basically initializes it, and then we do start to start the thread. And this is the predict function you saw before. As you can see, it accepts an input, an output, which is a callback, and then an exception. And as you can see, the exception will run if the input fails sending. This means if the server or the WebSocket is down for some reason. And this is basically all the code on the client side. So now naturally we are communicating with this port. But what is on the other side of the port? Well, it's some Python code, which is doing the exact same thing, but much simpler because it's Python. So of course we are loading the model.h5, which we have in the same folder. As you can see, it's right here in the project. We are using Keras model's load model. Once we have our model, we are establishing a connection using ZMQ with the server. And then we keep on looping forever and we keep on expecting bytes. So you may say, why are we expecting all of these bytes? This is basically 28 by 28 by 4. Because basically we are sending 28 numbers by 28, so we are sending 28 floats, but every single float is composed of 4 bytes, so if we do by 4, we get exactly this number. So this is why we are expecting exactly this number of bytes. Once we actually receive this number of bytes, we are going to convert them into a float array just because it's simpler, and then we are going to go into our model, and using the Keras package that we imported, we are going to predict uh, the response, and we are going to expect an answer. So for some reason, the model that I used wants them into this shape, which is like 1784, uh, which assu I assume is more helpful to the model itself. 
So, I mean, I guess I'm converting it to this form, but naturally this and this are gonna be different depending on the model that you are importing and that you are, like, depending on your inputs and outputs, so yeah. Once we actually have the prediction, we convert the prediction into bytes and we send them back to Unity. And now, just to finish the loop, Unity gets the prediction back from this function right here, runs the onOutputReceive function, which is the one that we set right here, uh, sorry, right here, and this predict function basically just calculates the right output and prints it on screen. And that's how the magic works, and just in this way we can do the execution of a model without actually converting the model into Unity, but just keeping it on a Python server. Now, there are some things that you can also add to this, you can have the server not be local, but actually be a, an outside server, maybe you could do it with, uh, uh, I don't know, a different kind of server, a different kind of backend. Another thing that you need to do though, if you have a local server, is that every time you run Unity, you also need to run the server, and you also need to rerun it if it crashes for some reason. You could do this via a script, and maybe I can show it in a different video, or, uh, as I said, you could just have this server run somewhere else, not on the client. And that's it, I hope you really enjoyed this fun little tutorial, I hope to do more soon, before college actually starts, and you know, if you enjoyed this video and it was really helpful to you, leave a like and be sure to share the channel with your friends, it would mean the most to me uh, if, you know, anyone actually got helped thanks to this video, because I actually, you know, just worked on this for fun, but I can clearly see how converting a model into Unity can become a problem sometimes, uh, with all of the different specs, and I also... And you have no idea how many exceptions I had when trying to convert this model into ONNX. Maybe I was doing something wrong on my end, uh, so you can tell me in the comments what you guys did in order to convert it. But I found this solution, which is also pretty nice, and if you are doing something just to test a model in Unity, it could be really viable. So let me know if this video helped any of you, leave any answers or anything you need in the comments, and I'm gonna be sure to leave all of the required materials for this video with the code itself in the description. That said, I hope you really enjoyed this video, leave a like if you did, and I'm gonna see you guys in the next one. See ya!